and that he died for me. Amen. Don't care what mankind says. I know he died for me and rose again the third day, man. Right. Why don't you get in the boat? <laughs> Stop walking through life all miserable and upset with yourself, man. Give his offer unto whosoever will. Matthew chapter number 12. This morning, start, we are starting place. A little bit more of uh, teaching. Obviously, there will be some preaching. The way it rolls. I'm going to go through a, a Bible subject this morning. And you probably, you probably heard bantered about Christianity, even in the lost world, for many, many years. That term is the will of God. You can hear that till the cows come home. Whatever that means, they don't come home. They'll lay down, they know it's going to rain. And if they lose their legs, they're ground beef. You know the way that works. But when you get in that whole thing, uh, you hear the will of God so thrown about. In our circles, you even hear lost people say, I'm just finding out what God wants me to do or what's, what, you know, what the will is. It, it's something that is so often just recited, but who takes the time to go through the Word of God and find out what it really means and says? So we're going to do that, Lord, one this one. This will not be exhaustive, but it'll be, well, exhaustive. So Matthew 12, <laughs> Matthew, Matthew 12, verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. Isn't it interesting how people will pull the family card on you? Oh, you know, you know, you know, mom and the brethren outside, you better drop everything you're doing and run out to them. Maybe not. He waited four days for one of his best friends to die and then go visit him. I said in the car, and I learned it from somebody else, you, ne you ever notice that Jesus Christ never runs anywhere? He never is in a hurry to go anywhere. And would you say he fulfilled the, word of, uh, the will of God? Look what the Bible goes on with me to say. We can just pray and close after that. was good enough right there, man. The <laughs> Bible says this in verse number 48. But he answered and said to him that told him, who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth. Let me read that again. That was a bad, bad... Uh, Bad inflection. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his, toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Thank you again, Father, for the morning. Pray your blessing upon the preaching and the teaching of your word. As we saw in Sunday school this morning, Father, please... Please, would you fill my heart with the Spirit of God and the Word of God that my tongue might say the Word of God. Thank you, Father, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It really, really reveals to me what's going on in my heart, Father, for all the explosions and foolishness that take place in my life as your child. Father, please help us to employ that Sunday school lesson, which will in turn help us to do the will of God. Thank you, Father, again for the morning. Thank you for the King James Bible. Thank you for the blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Please, Father, minister as only you can this morning. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. What an interesting thing when you read about the Lord's life on this earth, and you have snapshots, obviously, at his birth. You have one when he's two years old. You have one when he's 12. And then you have him when he's 30 at the baptism of his cousin John the Baptist. And then you pick up the three and a half years that he walks this earth as God manifests in the flesh. And you get to see the way that the God of glory conducts himself. But the one focal point that the God of glory, when he's manifest in the body, has is, I will always do the will of my Father. And right here, what you just saw in this passage is that if you want to be my brother, and I understand the context, if you're a child of God through the new birth, if you're a child of God, I believe in the, the name of the Son of God, you are a child of God. I understand that. But it goes further than that as a child of God, that if I really want to be aligned with how God thinks and acts, I need to find out what his will is and then do that will. I'd like to start off by saying this before we get even going into this. Let's go over to 2 Peter. We're, we're going to work our way through this. We're going to start with the lost folks first. And then we'll move on to the saved folks. But I, as I said at the beginning, people throw this term around that the will of God or the will of the Lord. I'm just trying to find out the Lord's will for my life. 
And I want to say this as we get going, and please tuck it away for later if you can. The will of God is specific. It is not mysterious. It's not shrouded. It's not some weird, you know, puff of vapor or smoke out there that nobody can know. Uh, even the secrets of God, the mysteries of God, are manifested in His Bible, such as, as it is with the will of God. You can know for sure what the will of God specifically is, but the plan of how you achieve it for each and every believer can be totally different. You need to know that because you'll get frustrated thinking that you're not on the same path as someone else or you're not doing the same thing as someone else and you'll think that you're an absolute failure and, well, I'm just not accomplishing the will of God for my life. No, the will of God is specific. But the plan and the details of that plan and the path, that varies from believer to believer. Are there certain things that are generic? Yes. Soul winning, street preaching, door knocking, things like that, giving. Those are, those are givens, I would say. But how God accomplishes that through your specific life and the specific path in your life, boy, that could be different for each and every believer. I don't want you to get wigged out this morning and sit here and go through this preaching and this lesson and say, well, I, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know. No, you're going to know the will of God by the time we're done. And then ask the Lord, Father, would you give me and set me on the path you'd have me to have to accomplish that will? So you can have a successful, fruitful Christian life. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When God does set your path for you, he's going to do it through that book. That's the light and the lamp he's given to each and every one of us to get on that path, stay on that path, to work out that will of God that's specific. Now, let's, let's start with this. I want to I hit the, the lost for people first. And you say, well, that's kind of a downer. Well, no, let's, let's hit this first, and we'll, and we'll go from there. 2 Peter 3. Did I say that, 2 Peter 3? You guys knew where I was going. 2 Peter 3, verse number 1 says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. That'll be a Wednesday night question. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, that means there was one previously. Anyway, but the same word we are, by the same word I kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Go over to 1 Timothy. Got a little bit of the Bible, make some comments. 1 Timothy chapter number 2, please. 1 Timothy 2. As we get going to this, if you are lost without Christ, you are directly against the will of God. I will say, I, I don't know who's lost or saved in this congregation. I believe that uh, most folks in this, in this congregation are saved. But if you're not saved, or for those out in TV land or YouTube land or whatever land it is out there, if you are not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the grace and mercy of Almighty God, by the power of the resurrection, that blood washing away your sins, you are directly against the will of God. For somebody out there who is lost without Christ, having no hope without God in the world, dead in trespasses and sins, if you are that way, there's hope for you. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. If you die and go to hell, it's against the direct will, the pronounced will of God in his Bible that he came to make sure you wouldn't perish. He made a way when there was no way for you to be saved from hell. He made a way for you to be saved from the penalty of your sins that we all deserve. The Lord, number one, is not willing that any should perish. But look, he gets even more stronger with it over in verse number one of 1 Timothy 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving a thanks be made for all men, for our kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet, peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Sorry, John Calvin. And to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men. Here it is. The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. God's will is so strong for everybody to be saved, he sent the very best he had from glory when he sent his son. The Bible word is ransom. 
What do you typically pay a ransom for? Somebody who's been taken or kidnapped. Everybody has been taken and kidnapped by sin. Everybody has been locked in bondage by the fear of death. That's Hebrews 2, 14 through 16. Everybody has been locked in by sin, held in bondage by sin, kidnapped by sin, and the fear of death. You know what Jesus Christ came to do? Pay your ransom and set you free. He came to make you free from that penalty of hell, that penalty of the fear of death, that bondage that comes with the fear of death, and the weight of sin. When you first got saved, did it not feel like an 800-pound gorilla got taken off your back? I'm not, we don't go by feelings, we go by the Word of God, but he, is not, he, he, it's not, he cannot be touched with the feelings of our first. He can be touched with our feelings. He came to take the burden off you of sin. That's his will. If you're lost here today, or if you're lost out in goofy land, I hope you tune in somehow, some way, and God directs you to hear the Word of God somewhere from a preacher who can tell you how to be saved because the Lord is not willing that he should perish. I, I don't even want to say this, but if you're, if you're lost without Christ, you've got to be one of the most foolish people I've ever met in my life when you don't have to go. If you had a black Amex card with the one that has the crazy limit on it, man, no crazy. I think it's no limit on. Jen, you got one. You've been using. It, I mean, for the last five years. I mean, that's why. That's why Jonathan's got to work fourteen jobs like a Jamaican man. He's out there. But I mean, but I mean, yet that black Amex. It basically has no limit on it. I know Amex typically does you pay off the balance, but you know what I'm saying. Just shut up. It's an illustration, man. The black Amex, I guess, is only given out to a, a very rare percentage of the of the public, if you will. Well, that black Amex, you can pretty much do anything you want, but go buy a Lamborghini with it, go buy, go buy Jupiter with it. Who cares? That's what Jesus Christ did for you. He gave you his blood as the ransom payment for your sin that you'd never have to taste the fires of hell for one second. Amen. Right off the bat, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. He will that all men be saved. So if you're out there and you're lost, and maybe considering, why am I here? What am I doing? Where am I going? What's the plan? Is there a divine plan? Is there an architect out there? Is there a creator? Who is he? What's he want? The first thing, if you're lost, is he wants you saved. He wants you saved. He made sure you'd have a way out. He gave you his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I wouldn't give my child for you. I wouldn't give my child for any of these reprobates you talk to. But I don't see him the way God sees him. Without hope, man. So the first thing he'd like to say to the unbeliever is, you need to trust my son as your Savior. Now go with me to John 5. We'll look at the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we'll look at the believer. John chapter 5. John chapter number 5. Pick it up with me in verse 26. John 5, 26. Actually, let's go to 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Interesting, he gets the Son of Man, Son of God, and right there in the resurre general resurrection. Anyway, verse number 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That's not ours. You know the difference on that on Wednesday night. Ours is the rapture, the calling out of the body of Christ. Verse number 30 says this, I can do nothing, I can do, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Can you imagine being God, the one who created all things, and then submitting yourself to someone else? You own it all, you made it all. And yet, you're going to put yourself in a subjective position to someone else when you are the very God that came down from glory. That's what the verse just said right there. The Father's given me authority. You're, in fact, you're going to hear my voice at the general resurrection. It's what he gave me to do, but you know what? I'm going to do what he tells me to do. You're the one running the show, Jesus. You're the one who is God manifest in the flesh. You're the word that was God and is God. And yet, you're going to do what your Father's will says to do? What a great lesson for you and I. I don't care who you think you are in this Christian life. There's always somebody that's your boss. 
And for you and I, it's God the Father. If Jesus Christ can submit to the will of his Father, how much more should you and I submit to the will of our Father? I'm just laying the foundation here because you know what? A lot of, we have a lot of mavericks in Bible-believing Christianity. I'm one of them. And so aren't you. You know what God has told you to do. You know what God has instructed you to do, but you choose to turn a blind eye to it and a deaf ear. You know what God has instructed you on a daily basis, and I'm not talking specifically about the will of God. We'll get into that in a second, but I'm talking about you know what God has told you to do. But it's that maverick nature where you're just not going to have anybody tell you what to do. It's that authoritative thing that your old father, the devil, struggled with in Isaiah 14. You're just not, you're not, not going to tell me what to do. I know, and thank God I'm saved and I'm a child of God and all those wonderful things. But you know what? I'm just not going to knuckle under underneath your authority. Well, your Savior did. Your Savior said, whatever the Father has sent me to do, I will do His will. All kidding aside, don't you think Jesus Christ could have come down here and done whatever he wanted to do? No, you need to think about this for just a second. Couldn't Jesus Christ have done whatever he wanted to do? What could you say to him? What, what could you do against him? I'll sneak up on him. You know what? Let me go get a band of, oh, I don't know, 15, 20,000 men, and we'll take them on. <laughs> Good luck with that. He's a man of war. The point being is that, you know what? The Savior himself, God himself, manifest in the flesh, said, you know what? I'm not here to do my own program. I'm to do the program, and I'm here to do the program of my Father. Whatever he wants, I'll do. Go with me over Luke 22. Luke 22. Luke 22. Luke 22, 39. Luke 22, 39. That old rebellious nature, man. Brother Kenny hit on it this morning about that old nature. You're not a liar by biblical justification, but you do lie. It's a sin of the flesh. You're not a rebel in the sense you're going to go to hell and spend your eternity in the lake of fire with the devil, the false prophet, and the beast. But boy, you and I sure do rebel after we've been saved. You say, well, that, that's your double speaking. No, there's the life in Christ, standing, and there's a life that I walk through this world, though I'm in Christ, but in the flesh. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And you can do things in your flesh that a lost person can do, except for go to hell. That's not, oh, once that damnable Baptist doctrine of once saved, always saved. No, stupid, it's a Bible doctrine. If you read the Chapters of Romans 6, 7, and 8, you find out exactly how God lays that out with the greatest Christian that ever lived, how he battled with it 30 years after he was saved. You're going to battle with it till the day you go home to glory. It's just whose will is going to win out every day. Is it my will or is it my Father's will? Look what the Bible says in Luke 22. 22, 39 says, And he came out and went as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives. That means they knew where to find him. That's pretty cool. To the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, by the way, uh, Mount of Olives, isn't that where he's going to come back one day? A lot of activity around that Mount of Olives when he's here. And his disciples also followed him. Verse 40, and when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing... Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthened him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he arose, and when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. I, I can't imagine. I don't, I've never gotten to this point where I battled with my heavenly father, where I started sweat drops of blood. Have you ever been in such fervent prayer with your heavenly father when he had something specifically for you to do and you were arguing with him about it and you got down and the grief and the, and the, and the movement was so great that sweat came out of you and it was blood? That goes over to Hebrews chapter number 12. You've not resisted unto blood yet. My savior did. This is such a thing. And he's not, he's not, this is not a battle about, oh, should I do something evil or wicked or do what God wants me to do? It's whether or not, 
Father, I've never sinned, I never will sin, but I'm about to become sin for them who knew, uh, sin, for, uh, sin for us who knew no sin. I'm about to take the cup of wrath from Almighty God poured out on me for something I've not done. He's going to get God's judgment for every one of us, past, present, out in the field. He, the sins that have been committed, God's going to take that cup of wrath from Jeremiah 25 and Psalm 75, and he's going to pour it out on his son who never did anything incorrectly. But do you see the tussle that's going on here in Luke? I can imagine Satan's right there. I can imagine the devil's right there saying, ah, you've done good up until now. Why don't you take a break? You know what? Why? You're, you're God. Why? Just do what you want. You know what? Let all these sinners die and go to hell. Let them all, just let them all go. Who cares? You say you, you're reading stuff into it. No, I'm not. I know those bulls of Bashan. I know, I know. See, when you read about the temptation of Christ, he wasn't just tempted that last day you and I read about. He's tempted all 40 days, and then it says the temptation ended for a season, and that boy was right back on our Savior. Don't tell me he's not in that garden right there going, let him go. You know they're going to betray you. They don't love you. They're all going to run away from you anyway. Nobody likes you, Jesus. Just go back to your father's throne. You say you're reading too much. Not at all. Don't you have whispers like that in your own ear every day as to who you're going to obey and whose will you're going to follow? You know what the Lord said right there? He says, you know what, Father, if thou be one, but you know what? At the, at the end of it all, Father, whatever you want, I'll do it. Even if it means going to a cross for people that will spit on me, revile me, and hate me. That's the tussle going on there. That's the foundation for where we're going to go now. Now, if you're saved here this morning, this next part is for you and for me. The will of God is specific for our lives. Let's do this. Let's go over to Romans. Uh, actually, let's go to Colossians first. Colossians 4. We've got a few. We can, we can scoot through them. Colossians 4. Colossians 4. The will of God is a huge thing. I mean, discipleship, to me is always been the missing cog between soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, and then church attendance. I mean, you'll, you will grow underneath a preacher if you get the right preacher to assist you in that, but there is something about when the preacher or the pastor, has in, he's invested in other men, and he trusts those other men, those other men invest in folks that are in the church. Because, you know, when you first get saved, you, you got to admit, you know you got saved. What else do you know? You're just like a, a ship without the rudder, you know? Just kind of floating around. Well, okay, well, I'm saved now. I, I did that. I settled that. I know, I, I know I'm saved uh, best I can. I don't know all the verses. I don't know the deity of Christ. I don't, I don't know the ambient temperature of the third heaven in August. I don't know any of that, but I know that my sins have been washed away, and I can, it just, wow, God did something for me I could never do on my own. Now what? Well, it's good to have someone come along and say, you know what, well, the will of God in your life is that we pursue the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you don't know the will of God and you try to invest in somebody else who has no idea, the newly saved, well, how can that growth process continue down the road? Look what the Bible says in Colossians chapter number 4. This is, this is a huge thing. Verse number 7 says this, All my state... I don't even want to read Tick a Kiss because Bert's over there. All my state... All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all things that are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called justice, or of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, look at this, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, for I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. You know what Epaphras' main deal was? I want to make sure every saint stands perfect in the will of God. Again, I don't know the plan of the details. I will not tell you what job to take. 
or who to marry. I can give you some stuff from the Word of God, but you've got to get along with God and figure some of these details because that Word is a lamp under your feet. But the will of God is something that's fixed. It's static. It doesn't move. And what Epaphras' ministry was amongst the believers is, I want you to stand perfect in that will of God. In other words, I want you to be complete. I want you to do everything for God you can possibly do on the right path, the right time, and everything. It's huge, man. That's Pauline epistle. You know what Colossians in your Bible is related to? What church age is? Now, now, now we're inviting a little bit of help. Right? It's Laodicea. Five times in the book of, epistle, of the epistle of Colossae uh, to the Colossians is the term Laodiceans or Laodicea. If you want to know what the Laodicean church age is like, go study the epistle written to the Colossians. And you know what? The will of God. I want, I want you to stand perfect. I want you to be complete in the will of God. I want you to know what God expects of you, and then I'm going to show you how to do it, but you've got to work out that salvation between you and the Lord. Work it out. Look what the Bible says to me over in Romans chapter number 1. Romans 1. Romans chapter number 1. How many times have we prayed for traveling mercies before we leave here? Not mocking that at all. But would you like to see what the Word of God has to say about traveling mercies? And the will of God? Look with me over in verse number 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Go over to chapter 15, Romans 15. What are traveling mercies based upon what you just read right there? By the what? The will of God. What happens if God in the plan for your life? Now, he wants you to go there, but it's to be a prosperous journey so Paul can impart some spiritual gift. I don't want to just have a traveling mercies for traveling mercy's sakes. I want to have traveling mercies by the will of God that whatever takes place between here and my house, God's behind it and I can trust it. You know how frustrating that is when you get a flat tire? Yeah. Oh, come on. It ain't that silent right now, man. I'm not saying anybody's out there putting a switchblade in your car, Polly, or anything like that in your tires, shredding your tires, man, or, you know, drilling a, you know, a screw in there. There's some good screws that can do that. But anyway, I'm just saying, you have no idea how this thing works out. Well, well I'm just going to get my car and go home. Well, what happens if God says, my will today is for you to impart some spiritual gift on somebody, and the spiritual gift that they're lost is the spiritual gift of eternal life through my son. Maybe God has waylaid you on the side of the road so you can witness to somebody. Isn't that horrible to think that? Because we all have places to go, people to see, things to do. Taco Bell, if I get there and there's one person in front of me, I'm going to snap and bench press their car and lose my mind. Because if, if I don't get the crunchy cheese taco, I'm going to lose it. It's only for a limited time, by the way, in case you're wondering. So I would suggest you go up there as a church, go witness everybody, get some, get some crunchy tacos, man. They are, <laughs> honestly, they're phenomenal. You buy them, the cheese drips out. I don't care if, I care if it's real or not. I don't care if it survives on nuclear age. It's good going down, man. Not so good. Well, anyway. Well, I'm just saying, but what happens if God interrupts you and says, you know what? Maybe I, in your journey, want you to be prosperous over here. Maybe you're going to meet a brother or sister in Christ that needs some encouragement. Didn't you meet one a few, few years ago when you were going, or last year? Oh, yeah. Remember? Mm -hmm. I'll remember for you, Kenny. It's okay, man. Oh, yeah. I know you're shutting down after Sunday school. You're like... I got five weeks off. Oh. But you remember, didn't, there was a guy out street preaching. Or no, was it uh, the one up in Enfield? You went and talked to him. Yeah. Maybe that's the prosperous journey God wanted to have through your travel, the travel mercy you asked for. That God, and you went by and encouraged the guy to stand out there by himself street preaching in Enfield. Yeah. That helps you out, man. When somebody comes along and says, I'm glad you're out here. Yeah. <laughs> My first thought is, why aren't you out here with me, stupid? But I'm like, oh, thank you, brother. That's very nice. <laughs> But you don't know the prosperous journey. We just think, oh, traveling mercies get me home safely. What happens if God waylays you to the side and says, you know what? I have, by my will, I want you to go and part a spiritual gift to somebody. 
So when you pray for trial, I'm not trying to negate you praying for trial and mercies. We should do that. You should be careful for nothing. But when you pray for trial and mercies, let's do it the Bible way. Look what the Bible says in 15, chapter 15, verse 24. 15, 24 says this. Uh, actually, let's do 23. But now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey to Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for I have pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may, be you, uh, may with you be refreshed on the God of Peace be with you all. Amen. You know what Paul said? I'd like to do this. This is my plan. This way. But you know what? Ultimately, the will of God. I'll submit to it if he wants me to come and take care of that for you. To have fellowship with other saints. To actually give money to the poor saints that are Jerusalem. That's the will of God, man, and traveling mercies. Go on with me over to uh, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. I know some of you might know this already, but it's, it's a good reminder for you. The will of God, the will of God. What's the will of God for my life? Preacher, what's the will of God for my life? Well, I'm going to show you from the Word of God. But how that plan is, I, I can't tell you what school to send your kids to. I can't tell you to homeschool or public school. I can't tell you anything. I don't, can't tell you, I'm not going to tell you to invest in the stock market or not. I'm not going to tell you whether to get the shot or not get the shot. That's not my purview. My purview is the book. You get alone with God and you figure it out. The power of the Holy Spirit. I know the will of God, but Lord, what's my path? to accomplish that will, that I can stand perfect, fulfilling all the will of God in my life on your behalf. Because I'd like to get home to the judgment seat of Christ and have him say, you know what, you did good. You listened to me when you're supposed to listen to me. You went where I told you to go. I gave you my lamp. You listened to my lamp. I guided you exactly to the place. You were supposed to be on time to the right people with the right frame of mind. Wouldn't you like to hear God say, you did well? I would. What are, you, what are you doing this for? Just to say, oh, I go to church again. And, oh, I, gave, I gave a little money in the bar for you. Know, oh, ha, ha. Don't you realize you're going to stand before your king one day and get to see him? And he's going to say, speak. What's your account, son? Wouldn't it be good to be armed with, you know what, Lord? I did the will of God the best I could because you spelled out for me and I tried to get on the path you wanted me to go on. I wanted to follow the plan. You know what? So I could be ready for this day. You don't want to fail that test. Just looking at those eyes, I think is going to be enough. And seeing those wounds is going to be enough for me. And that'll be it. I'm not talking about living with regret. I'm talking about now that I know the will of God, Lord, help me to perform it. Get on the right path and do it with the right heart. Look at what the Bible says to me in Ephesians chapter number 5, verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. He says right in the middle, he goes, you know what the will of the Lord is? He says, I want you to be sober, clear-headed, and clear-minded about everything. We want to jump right to booze and alcohol and all that, and I get it, it's right in the context, I understand that. Be not drunk with wine, where is excess? But you've got so many saved people walking around that are so just flitty and all over the joint and double-minded and triple-minded and quadruple-minded and just walking around with just like, oh, you know, oh, this is great. And I... You're supposed to be sober about it. 
You can laugh and have a good time. You should enjoy your salvation. You should have the joy of the Lord that's your strength. You should be happy in the Lord. But you know what? You ought to be sober about people dying and going to hell. You ought to be sober about your brothers and sisters in Christ serving in other places. You ought to be sober about the life you live. Your life is not your own, man. You're bought with a price. You don't belong to you if you're saved. Doesn't that make you angry right now? Doesn't it make you just want to resist? It does me. It wants me to break the shackles off that he broke, it broke off. It, it makes me just want to go wild and be that maverick we talked about a little while ago. But that's not sober thinking. That's not clear thinking. you got so many saved people walking around right now thinking this is God and that's God and this is doctrine and that's not doctrine and this is a good church and that's not a good church and these are good songs and these are mine. And you guys, there's people all over the place. And the Lord says, you know what? The will of the Lord is to be sober, sober-minded. Think about heavenly things. Do you have to get things done tomorrow? Do you have to go to work tomorrow? I do. I, don't, we don't, I think it's, what is it, tomorrow's uh, President's Day, right? We don't have it off, but I mean, don't, don't you have things to do? Your mind right now, even probably in church with that Bible open and somebody preaching to you, your mind is already thinking about what you have to accomplish this afternoon. Your mind is already thinking about what you have to do with your job. Maybe you have a project due. Maybe you have somebody at work that you're odds with. Maybe you have a review coming with you. I don't know what's going on. But to be sober-minded is I can handle that stuff through the power of the Lord. But you know what? I want to think about heavenly things. I want to be heavenly-minded about the things that matter for eternity, knowing that this all plays out in my life for that day at the judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord says right there, the will of the Lord is that you be sober about your life. You ought to look at your family that's lost and be broke up about them. I've been praying for my brother Frank and my sister Terry forever. My dad, forever. Does it bother you your kids are going to hell? Does it bother you? Do you even care or you sleep right now? You sleep spiritually, you sleep mentally? Do you even care your grandkids don't know anything about Jesus Christ but you're saved? Do you care about what you see? What you, does it bother you your nation's just a bunch of filthy, fornicating perverts? Does it bother you that the churches are wrecked and Christians are falling by the side? Do you, does it bother you at all? Are you sober-minded about anything to do with this book or just, ah, I don't care. I go to church, put in my hour a week like a Catholic, but I'm saved now, and then I leave. I don't care what that sounds like. Go take it to the bank if you don't like it. I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm over it in my own life. I wish to God you'd be over it in your life. You're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you think, eh, yeah. I don't really care. Well, the will of the Lord is you get sober mind. Get your head on straight, saved person, for Jesus Christ. That's not Dave Brown saying. That's your Bible you claim to believe. That's the book you claim to love. He told you to be sober, not my church or my doctrine. He told you to say, smarten up. Don't be drunk with wine where there's excess. Well, that's just drinking. I don't drink. No, pick your head, pick your head out of it wherever it is. Get sober in your life, saved person. Think of this thing as more than just coasting through life. Unbelievable, man. Does it bother you at all you're going to see him one day and you're a wretch? And she could use some improvement, like we heard in Sunday school with the tongue and the heart? I, I've heard that before. Yeah, that's a, that's a good example. That you, you just get the Band-Aid ripped off you and you don't like it. That's a good way to say, man, I had that before. Yeah, I know. Kicked you right where you live. Yeah, I had to say amen in the front row because you're all looking at me. <laughs> First Thessalonians 4. I hate you, Kenny. First Thessalonians 4. You can always pick on certain subjects in the Bible, and it'll just make everybody just go deader in a stinking graveyard at 2 in the morning. The tongue is one of them. Man. First Thessalonians chapter number, uh, chapter four, verse number one. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that, uh, Lord Jesus, that ye, uh, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. 
For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond defraud his brother in any, man, uh, in, in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness." Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. The will of God is we live clean lives. That's not haircuts, man. That's not watching, you know, I don't eat pork because I want to be more holy. That's not what he's talking about. It's personal cleanliness and holiness. You abstain from fornication. You say, well, I haven't cheated on my wife. In your heart you have. In your mind you have. Women do the, can do the same thing, but it's more prone that men do that stuff. Because we are attracted by what we see with our eyes. And he says, the will, I mean, it's, it's, it's in like 96 font in my Bible. The will of God is to abstain from fornications. That what? You should live and clean, keep yourself clean your vessels and, and, and keep your vessels holy. That's not Baptist rigid doctrine like the fools back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. That, you know, you wear arrow shirts and Hager slacks, you're saved, and the rest of the people are, well, they're just living like the devil. It's personal cleanliness through the power of the Spirit of God. It's not rules and regulations. We don't have those here. Wear a tie in the pulpit. That's a tough one to do, isn't it? Other than that, the Spirit of God's got to control you, and the book's got to control you. We don't have a big sign out there that says this is our church covenant. The book is the church covenant. It's weird, man. And it's not some weird thing like, uh, you know, uh, you, 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 better, you better not wear wingtips, man. And tassels. Tassels are gay. I wear tassels. Darren Maines thinks they're gay and of the devil. That's why I wear them. I'm just saying, man, you don't get caught up in that stuff. How about your personal everyday thought life? How about your personal imaginations that run through your head and your heart? What about the evil you think towards one another and the evil you think towards your neighbor and the evil you think? Just, just think about that for, for, for a minute. That's part of possessing your vessel in, in cleanliness. That's abstaining from fornication. Well, that's just sexual sin. Oh, I, I get it. I understand that. But can't you go and join yourself to another god and commit idolatry? And that's what God accused the nation of Israel of. You're playing the harlot. You're fornicating, committing adultery with other gods. So if you and I allow other gods in our heart and our mind, you're committing fornication against your father. Oh, I'd never do that, preacher. Oh, yeah, you would. It's easier than you think, man. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 4. The Bible says this, for as much as Christ, verse number one, for as much as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Isn't that a horrible thing right there? When your flesh gets down, it's typically when you sin the least. It's when the flesh is alive and feeling good. You feel like you can take on anything. Man, verse number two, that he should, that he should no longer li- uh, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Now I know some of you are sitting there going, I know these verses where they're at. Have you ever seen them in the light that God's dealing with you in the mor- this morning service about it? To me personally, I'm like, seriously, these are, I've read these, all kidding aside, probably 200 plus times. Then you actually sit down and read it, and you're like, am I really doing the will of God? Am I really accomplishing what he has pronounced in black and white? Not the path of the job I work or the resume I put together to get a job or what? No. Am I just doing what he's laid out in plain English, the will of God, man? You're like, I don't think I am, man. It's a wild thing. The will of the Lord is to abstain from fornication. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8. The Bible says this, verse number 1, 2 Corinthians 8, 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the church of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abound unto the riches of their liberality. For their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, and unto us, 
by the will of God. Do you know these folks were stretched out of measure beyond physical capability? And yet, you know what they said? We'll give ourselves to God first, and we'll give ourselves to the ministering to other people. You've heard the acronym JOY before, have you not? Jesus, others, you. You minister to the Lord first, and you know what the Lord's going to tell you to do? Now that you've ministered to me, go minister to them. But Lord, what about me? Minister to me, then go minister to those around you. Self-centered Christianity. It's about me. I. I. Look at what I have done. Look at what I've accomplished. And the Lord says, no, man, it's about me first and the others around you. Those Macedonians and those folks, they had nothing. It says they're deep, they're deep poverty. But you know what the will of God was? Give it all to me. Give it all to those around you. Remember back in the book of Acts when it first starts out, how the church is, the, is getting rolling? What did they have? What was that phrase they used about, you know, like Ananias and Sapphira, when you, were, when you sold something, what were you supposed to do? Bring it in and distribution out. How about every one of us next Sunday brings our paychecks in cash and puts it on the pulpit and says, distribute it wherever you'd want. That's what we call a clench right there. That's what we call a... That's not really happening, is it? I'm going through the church covenant. I'll make sure it's not in there. They used to have a give it all Sunday in Rochester, New York. I was there for it more than once. Their offerings were up over 50 grand in a morning service. What about their bills? I don't know. God somehow took care of it. And don't listen to me. I'm not talking about this tithe and stuff and the first fruits. Don't, please, don't let your mind or your heart go there to defend your position. I'm telling you that the will of God was for these Macedonians, you know what? We love the Lord. We gave ourselves to the Lord. And you know what? We're going to give everything we have to everybody else. And somehow God still took care of them. I don't, living by faith. I don't live by faith, man. I live by faith when it's convenient for me. I live by faith when everything's good, man. So don't you. Those Macedonians said, you know what? Out of our, our deep poverty and great trial of afflictions, whatever you folks need, we'll do it. You know why? Because it's the will of God. Plain, plain as day. The will of God is help one another, support one another. Well, that's back, you know, that's 2,000 years ago and all that stuff. Do you pray for people consistently in this church? Do you even know we have a prayer list in the back? Or if you don't have a prayer list, can you, like I said, can you go down the rows and think about people? Brother Justin over here. Brother Mike and Merrill when they sit in the back. Uh, uh, Megan Merrill in the back. He just goes, John and Susan, I, I go, I, I'm not being smart with you. That's how I memorize it. So if you change your seats, you're not getting prayed for. <laughs> but I work my way, I work my way through, man. Yeah. That's the best way for me personally to do it. But I do have the prayer list. I don't write down things just for the sake of writing down. That's, that's part of, I, I know we don't, we're not going to give all our money to help. I, I get it. I know that. It's just not, I'm not going to kick against that pr th those pricks. I get it. But you could do something like pray for everybody. So that's the, that's the will of God. He just read it. Well, brother, I, I'm trying to find out the will of God for my life. How many more do you need? It's plain as day. Path might be different. Plan might be different. But the will of God is so specific, you can't miss it unless you want to miss it. Give me, give me a couple more. Go with me over to uh, 1 Peter. This is always a fun one for me. 1 Peter. Thank God he's the apostle to the circumcision. Right, Brother Burke? Yes, yeah, man. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. That's good preaching, brother. That's good preaching. I like that St. Patrick and Peter stuff. 1 <laughs> Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. The Bible says this, 1 Peter 3, and I, I know we've been here many times. 
1 Peter 3, verse 14 says this, But if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer. To every man ask you the reason of the hope which is in you, that, that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, may be be ashamed of that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. Now bear with me. Look at verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached on the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone to heaven, and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities Power is being made subject unto him. While you're right here, go over to chapter 4. While you're right here, go over to chapter 4, please. 4.12 says this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the uh, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them suffer according to the will of God. Uh, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of the souls to him in well-doing as in a faithful creator. I'd like to say this on this point. We often read 3, 18, about how Christ suffered the just for the unjust and all that. And it's a phenomenal verse. But did you see how he tapped that into verse 17, that the will of God you suffer for well-doing? You know what? You and I ought to suffer like Jesus Christ suffered. That's in the context of chapter 4 as well. If any man suffer as a Christian, a Christ one, you say, well, I'm not going to be put on a cross. I'm not going to be mocked and ridiculed going through the town, and they're not going to pick up stones to stone me and I escape, uh, uh, escape out some other way. They're not going to do that. Aren't you told to crucify yourselves every day? Aren't you say, doesn't the Apostle Paul say, I die daily? The crucifixion for you and I is not a physical one. It's a spiritual one and a yielding of the members to serve Jesus Christ. And the will of God is we should suffer like his son did. I don't, you're not going to go through, I don't think, Harlan Popov or Richard Wormbrand. I don't think the, the preachers you read about, Tancom and those guys way, way back, and Chris Ostom and, and, and all those folks, you're probably not going to get your, you know, your feet, the skins of your feet cut and then rocks put in and then your skin sewn up over the rocks so you walk on rocks. They did that, by the way. It's one of the tortures they did to our brethren. And you say, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Why would God do it? It's the will of God you suffer like your son suffered. Yeah. Isn't that horrible? Isn't that horrible? You can preach on just about anything, but when you talk about holy personal living, you talk about fasting, you talk about suffering. Those things go over like a lead balloon in any of even our churches because the flesh loves itself. And though I'm crucified with Christ, you always do what? Leave one hand free. Just in case you want to rip those other nails out and go back and live in your life the way you'd like to live it. Well, the will of God is don't live for yourself. Suffer and take it on the chin like my son did for you. I don't get all that, man. But I know this, and I do believe this, that when we get home to glory and we go to that judgment seat of Christ, I think we're going to see some women up there that got their babies tore up for Christ. You're going to see some women there that were slit from stem to stern. You're going to see some women there that were boiled because they wouldn't reject Jesus Christ. You're going to see some younger folks that trusted Christ, young girls and, and, and young men that would not renounce Jesus Christ or that Bible. 
and you think you and I have done something for the Savior? I'm not comparing ourselves among, I'm not trying to be like that. That's not enough. I'm just thinking, I really don't fulfill this will of God very often. Now they mock down the street. Oh, wow. A guy yesterday, I kid you not, he went by uh, uh, Paul Inas. He went outside. Honestly, he flipped us the middle finger. But I'm not exaggerating. That guy was 80, 85 years old, had the old fisherman's hat down. He's like, I mean, I mean I, honestly, he was, he, that was prune juice central, man. That boy was, and, but he had enough hatred in his heart to flip a preacher off of the scripture sign on the corner with his middle finger. Oh, that's, you're, oh, you're suffering. A guy that, a guy that captained uh, the, the, the flying Dutchman flipping me off? That's suffering for Christ? Really? Read any books about real suffering? What they went through? But that's for the will, that's the will of God. You ought to stand up for Jesus Christ on your job. And you can do it the right way. And if it costs you your job, God says, good job. Just watch your testimony. Don't be a jerk about it. You don't have to be obnoxious about it. But you can stand up for your Savior. You can be a light to those folks in your family. All can you say, so what if you lose your family for the cause of Christ? I know that's, the one that, that, that's one of the many things they hate about me. It's on my profile, on my Match.com profile, is that I always preach against the family. I don't preach against the family, but I love him more than I love my family. And if your family says, we don't like you, we don't want you around because of Jesus Christ, then you know what? You're fulfilling the will of God. You see how God shapes this thing in his Bible to clear out all the, uh, I don't really know what the will of God is. Well, that's a big one right there, man. <clears throat> Suffer for well-doing. Uh, we got we to we move. Romans 8. Romans 8. We got, we, got, we got two more. We got two more. We can do it. We can do it. Romans 8. I was trying to come up with I took from Kenny, then Kenny went too long, and then we started song so late, but it's just not working. So Romans 8. I'm trying not to deceive you, Kenny, or lie. Be a false witness. Romans 8, verse 26. I love Romans 8.28, preacher. Okay, well, why don't we read the verses around it? 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also help with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us with the groanings, with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh an intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And that's where we stop. What did you miss in verse 27 that makes 28 key? The intercession that's made and the all things that work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose, are all going to work for the will of God. It's not you getting a Lexus or a bigger house or all that stuff. What's the will of God in the context? Look with me in verse number 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. They might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You know what the context of Romans 8.28 is and the Spirit making the intercession for you? It's all to accomplish the will of God. And the will of God in this context is what? To you, for you and I to be conformed to the image of His Son. It's not to get what you want to get. It's not for God to answer your crazy willy-nilly prayers and you think, well, I didn't say that right. Oh, the Spirit will just take that to God and make it right. No! The Spirit makes intercession, takes your prayers according to the will of God to make you and I more like Christ. Not to be the sugar daddy in the sky. Not to be the magic genie that says, oh, I read my Bible. Let me rub it three times and say in Jesus' name, and he'll give me whatever I want. The prayer, intercessory prayer of the Spirit of God is not mumbo-jumbo or some mystical thing. It's going to be tied to the will of God, and the will of God in that passage is for you and I to be conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. That just destroyed Romans 8.28 for probably 10 million people out there. Because, oh, Romans 8.28. Don't Romans 8.28 somebody when their kids have just died. Well, you know, brother, Romans 8.28, you're going to get cracked. We like to call it Romans 8.28 in them. You know, drop the Romans 8.28. That's not the time to say that. You, 
maybe the best thing is just not to say anything. Because you know what God's doing through that? He's working on that person through that death and that tragedy to make them more like Jesus Christ. As hor you know why? Because that's the will of God. The will of God is not for you just to stay saved. He's going to shape you and mold you and form you to be like his son. And that means knocking it off the wheel and putting the clay back on the wheel and throwing some water on the wheel and getting a rough edge out there and smoothing out this side. And, oh, that's too big right there. And talk, you don't think that's true? Go to Jeremiah 18 and read it sometime. Let's go down to the potter's house and see how the potter does stuff. He shapes and molds that vessel according to his will for you and I to be like Jesus Christ. We want the glory, we want the praise, we want the exaltation, but we don't want the path to get through Gethsemane. We don't want to go through Gethsemane to get to the cross, and then that's what those things come before, the crowns. So it's the will of God. You just read it. Pauline epistle, man, of all things. Look what the Bible says to me. Last one, 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. I did say the last one. You know how that rolls, right, Brother Jonathan? You're like, oh, last one, yeah, come on, man. Can you call Panda Palace now, speed dial? He doesn't see it. Get that order going. I'm with you, man. First Thessalonians chapter number... I'm sorry? Now that you said it, it's going to happen. It is going to happen, I know, man. <laughs> First Thessalonians. It's not the will of God for you to have Chinese food today. <laughs> First, <laughs> First Thessalonians 5, <laughs> verse 14. The Bible says this, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded... <laughs> Now, see, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't even going to, I was going to say, Father, I'm not going to do it. Thank you, Lord. But Bird is not feeble-minded. He's a genius, and you know that. Yep. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's move on. See, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever fall that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Why do those two words just have to come out at 96 font again? Verse 16 says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. In everything that I like that goes my way, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. But look what, he, look what he attaches right after giving thanks. What's the next verse say? What happens when you and I become unthankful? You quench the Spirit of God and His working in your life and mine. Unthankfulness will kill you, man. Unthankfulness will make you bitter, boy. It'll turn you inside out, man, when you're unthankful. I don't, and I don't believe from reading the book many, many times through and the Spirit of God showing me and teaching me things, that's not to say... Wow, thank you, Lord, you wiped my whole family out in a boating accident. But after you settle down for a while, I say, thank you, Father, for the time I had with them. And Father, may something good come of this for your honor and glory and praise. And I don't feel very thankworthy worthy right now, but I know you put your son on the cross for me. And I can be thankful. See, it's easy to be thankful when health is good, cars running, yeah. bills paid, man. It is. I'm not mocking you at all. It's in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God. What well, would you like to do the will of God today? Start giving him thanks. Thank him for your food. Well, that's stupid. No, didn't Jesus Christ bow his head over the loaves and fishes? Isn't that how they knew him when he broke the bread on the road to, uh, the road to Emmaus? And they come back, and what, after he did what? They said, that's him, gone. Giving of thanks for just food, simple things. Thank you, Father, I can still afford gasoline. Instead of complaining about Joe Biden. Thank you, Father, we can still preach in a pulpit and open up a King James Bible. Thank you, Father, we can go out in the street and hand out gospel tracts. Thank you, Father, I'm breathing today. And I can see, and I can hear, and I can taste. Like we saw last week with the mercy of God. It's not hard to give thanks in everything. Well, it's the will of God, is it not? Romans 12. Romans 12. We knew we couldn't get past this without Romans 12. 
you knew you knew we'd have to go here at some point in time because I think I think just going through this for my own self personally and I think for you as well this is the linchpin or the key to this whole thing of the will of God 12 one says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing your mind, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God you cannot do the will of God perform the will of God without saying Lord today I'm a living sacrifice it won't happen Ephesians chapter 6 this is the last one Ephesians 6 seriously Ephesians 6 this is not, like I said, this is not, you, you can't hit it all. But I trust it will do the job. I'm thankful that his word does not read vo return void unto him. 6.1 says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that the, uh, uh, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Haley's not here, so I can read this verse. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. I loathe that child. <laughs> She's, that's my favorite verse. I got the one in Colossians too. Okay, go away. Go in your room. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Number one, you got to yield your body as a living sacrifice. Number two, you got to do what God has told you to do, regardless if anybody around you will follow you, applaud you, pat you on the back, or says, attaboy. You just read it right there. Don't do any of this for the will of God's sake, so other people get to see it and cheer you on. I'm glad when you get uh, exhortation and help from the brethren and say, good job, stick to it. But I'm saying, you got to guard your motive as to why you're doing the will of God. Is it so men can see me? Can men, can men see what I'm doing so they prop me up? Or you just humbly do the will of God throughout your life? And at the end of the race, God says, I'll reward you. I'm for, nothing has gone unnoticed with me. Thank you for doing it for my approval and not theirs, with the right heart, singleness of heart. That's the will of God in a very, very brief nutshell this morning. I, all kidding aside, you need to consider these things, man. The will of God is not some weird, ethereal experience. It's laid out in the book. It's just whether or not you and I are going to do it and yield ourselves to do it with the right motive. Brother Burke, can you pray for us this morning, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for the message that we've heard from your word this morning. Lord, thank you how you tied things together. Um, uh, not a tough one this morning, Lord, but obviously you did it. Thank you for the way that we would speak the truth in love, glorify that one to another. Amen. Let's speak the truth in love, Lord. And you are that truth, and my word is true. Lord, yeah, amen. God, that you don't make it this uh, hidden mystery that people often make it to be, like you're playing hide and seek with it. Yeah, amen. But you lay it out exactly what you want, exactly what your will is. So often you don't want to do it. Yeah. Uh, Lord, thank you for your long suffering toward us and your patience and your love and kindness. And thank you. Amen. I don't know how many times you've reminded us of these things. And yet I still don't master them. And uh, I thank you to just ran them by me again and ran them by us. And Lord, I pray that we would uh, yield ourselves to you and realize we know it, but sometimes we put it on yeah. our head that Amen. you are worthy. It should be an honor 
like to please you and serve you and do things for you. Thank you for the privilege to be able to. Do Amen. And I, Lord, I pray that we would be faithful and you find us faithful when we stand before you. We look forward to you coming back for us. Amen. And, uh, Lord, we are excited about that day. I am. And we pray that Amen. We